Hello everyone, I'm Fola. Welcome to the ninth episode of the Diversifying Research Podcast. This is a podcast where we amplify the voices of underrepresented individuals who are either involved in research themselves or engage other underrepresented groups in research. Over the course of this limited podcast series, we'll critically consider how to improve the inclusion of underrepresented voices in research. During this episode, we're joined by Maria Piggin, who works in the Patient Experience Research Centre at Imperial College London. I'm going to speak to Maria about the differences between public involvement, engagement and participation from the point of view of researchers, the importance of involving the public in research and the support available to researchers to involve the public in their research. Hello, Maria. How are you? Hi, Fala. I'm good, thanks. Awesome. So to start off with, could you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. So my name is Maria Piggin. I'm the Partnerships and Training Manager at the Patient Experience Research Centre, which sits within the School of Public Health at Imperial College London. So our team does a lot of research in terms of patient experience type topics, understanding the patient point of view, and we also provide support and training and advice to researchers on public involvement. So how to involve the public in their research as to make their research better. Thank you. You've got such great experience. I think you are the perfect person to really speak about public involvement. So within public health and research spaces, public involvement, engagement and participation are terms which are often used. Can you please explain how public involvement is different to engagement and participation from the perspective of researchers? So I think it's good to think about those three terms, participation, engagement and involvement on a continuum. So there are all ways that members of the public and patients can get involved in research, but in different ways. So some people might have heard of participation in a research study. Sometimes somebody is called a subject if they're somebody who's being studied as part of research. So that's essentially what you are. You're either getting your blood taken or you're giving an interview and that is part of someone's research study. Public engagement is a bit further along the continuum where you're hearing about research. So a researcher is telling patients and members of the public about their research, they're answering questions, And this could be about the research project itself or the results of the project. And involvement is at the very furthest end of the continuum. So we like to think of it as the most sort of partnership type of the three. So patients and the public and researchers are sort of working on the same team together to try and make the research better. So patients and the public are on the thinking team is another way of describing it. So although they might not be researchers, they bring their perspective as somebody who is a member of the public, who gets the flu, or perhaps they're a patient with a certain condition and they have lived experience, or they might be a family member or a carer of somebody who has a certain condition. But that perspective can really bring new light and new information to researchers that they might not be aware of because they haven't got what we call that lived experience themselves. Thank you for explaining the differences between those three terms. Can you give more precise examples of what public involvement activities are? Sure. So one really important way that researchers could involve the public in their work is really getting the public and patients to help choose the right research question. So it might be that a researcher has an idea about what they think a good question is for a certain patient group to be answered, but the patients might have a completely different perspective. For example, patients with a certain condition might have a symptom that causes them their quality of life to not be great on a daily basis. And the researcher might be looking for a cure for that condition. But if they actually spoke to the patients, the patients might say, look, cure might be 20 years away, but could you do something about this pain I have in my left arm that really causes me a lot of issues with my everyday life? And if I didn't have that 
or as another symptom, things could be a lot better while there is currently no cure. So helping to identify the most important question for the patients or the people who are being researched is really important. So that's one way. Those seem like pretty interesting and impactful activities, actually. So why do you think public involvement is so important? Really, it's about improving the research. It's about bringing a different pair of eyes, a fresh perspective that isn't a researcher's perspective, but as I mentioned, someone with lived experience just might have a completely different take or perspective on something that could really add value to research. So one example that I've seen that was really powerful is the wife of a Parkinson's patient noticed that he had this really musky sort of smell about him. And then when she went to a Parkinson's patient group meeting, she also noticed that that smell was in the room. And she actually approached a researcher and mentioned this observation she'd made. And it actually led to some research being done about this particular topic in terms of identifying a biomarker for Parkinson's disease that is linked to that smell. Those are the kinds of perspectives that a researcher would never be able to necessarily know because they're not living every day with a condition. That's just another example of the sort of nuances that a patient or a member of the public or a family member can bring to research. That is so, so interesting. Is it actually compulsory for researchers to do public involvement? You wouldn't be able to find a funder really in the UK that didn't want a researcher or didn't ask a researcher to have done or to do public involvement as part of their study before they would give them funding. So the National Institute for Health Research, the NIHR, is one of the main public funding research bodies and that's essentially taxpayer money that's been used for research. So this element of the taxpayer has paid for research so there is a democratic right for them to have a say in the research that's going on, never mind the fact that it will improve the research, make it more relevant to patients and the public and hopefully ensure that the study is successful so patients will say what kind of things in a study don't appeal to people so therefore the researcher will be able to make sure they recruit enough people because it's an acceptable sort of schedule of, say, visits to the hospital. For example, if someone's got fatigue, they're not going to want to go and have their blood taken three times a week, but maybe the researchers haven't remembered that. So it's really good to have somebody bringing a different perspective saying, look, I think that's too much of a burden. I think you should reduce it to a blood test every time they have another checkup when they're already in the hospital. So that those sorts of things improve what we call recruitment to a study, so who chooses to take part in the first place and also keep them in the study so they don't get annoyed with the things they have to do or they find it too burdensome and then they drop out. So it increases the retention of people in studies. So what I'm talking about is sort of clinical studies there. Of course, research can be other things like interviews or observational research or reviewing data. But those examples I was giving were sort of more to do with clinical trials where people are asked to visit a clinical trial facility and do a blood test or a urine test or whatever it may be. And you've mentioned some of the benefits of public involvement for research development, but what do you think are the benefits of public involvement to researchers? So I think that apart from improving the design and relevance of their research to patients in the public, you know, it has a lot of other advantages. For example, There's a research excellence framework that researchers need to take part in. And there's a section of that called pathway to impact. And public involvement is one of those things that can evidence how their research is impacting the general public or the population that they are researching. I think it can improve their contacts and their networks because members of the public, they have jobs, they have contacts that the researcher could benefit from. They may even be somebody who might know someone who could fund the next research project after the researcher completes the one they're on. 
So there are all sorts of ways it builds their confidence and being able to talk to members of the public, especially about the work that they're doing. And it obviously helps with the transparency and accountability of research. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of publicly funded research that goes on and being open about what you're doing and how you're doing it is all very important for their transparency and accountability aspect of being a researcher, especially with public funds. And I guess another, especially with public engagement, where you're explaining your research and answering questions, which you also do in involvement, but there's a quote that I sometimes refer to, which is something by Albert Einstein, which he apparently said, if you can't explain it, then you don't understand it well enough. So I think that being able to explain even complicated research to people who don't have a scientific background is really a skill and one that researchers should be developing because when they write applications to funders for research funds, they have to write what we call a lay summary, which is writing something in really simple terms so that someone without a scientific background can understand it. Those are some really important advantages. I love the quote by Einstein. It's so true. Of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. I wonder, could you speak about some of the public involvement opportunities which are taking place right now around COVID-19? Sure. So we've been really overwhelmed by the interest from the general public in COVID-19 research. I guess that's really because it concerns everyone and everyone is affected by it. So it's been really interesting that so many people want to like be involved or hear about what we're doing. So some of the things we've been doing have involved some antibody testing at home by members of the public of kits that they get sent in the post and they get asked to prick their finger and put the blood in a little test kit and it shows whether they have antibodies against the COVID-19 infection or not. So that's involved a lot of public involvement. So we've done things like we've had Zoom calls where we talk about the research, we answer questions, and then we put people into smaller groups and breakout rooms and we have discussions with them about their concerns about research or the design or what if the kit doesn't work properly. Finding out people's concerns really about before the research is underway so that you can try and address things that people are concerned about or communicate the answers to questions they might have, which might stop them, you know, taking part, for example. So we've done a lot of that. We've done surveys about the way people are feeling, where they're getting their information from, what their behavior is like. Are they changing their behavior in accordance with the government guidelines? Or is their personal situation such that they can't comply with the guidelines because they live in a house where they can't sleep in a separate room from someone if the guidelines ask them to? So it's been quite difficult because we've had to move all of our public involvement work online and we are very aware that not everybody has access to the internet or devices to access the internet. And we know that that is a part of the population that we're potentially not able to invite to as many of these public involvement activities because of the fact that they do involve the internet and sort of Zoom calls or Teams calls. But we're trying to explore other ways that we can involve people like perhaps phone calls one-on-one or where it is possible to engage community leaders to try and find out the best and most accessible way to involve people then we're trying to do that. But it's certainly been a learning experience and sort of a very interesting time for us all. That's really good to hear that you're being as inclusive as possible when it comes to trying to engage people who don't necessarily have access to devices. Can you share a bit about what some of the results of the surveys have been and what you've learned from some of the focus groups? Sure. It would depend on, for example, the topic. But if I could give maybe um, a couple of examples. So I mentioned we were doing antibody testing by sending people these kits at home. So we found out from one of the exercises involved actually observing somebody doing the test on themselves and seeing if they followed the instruction booklets and whether the instructions that were given to them made sense and whether the equipment that they were asked to use in the instruction booklet 
was easy to use. And so from that, it was really useful because we realized that the way that the instructions were explained to begin with didn't really help people use the kit. So for example, they had to prick their finger and it wasn't clear which end of the thing with the needle in it they had to put on their finger and all of that sort of stuff would have really hindered the research if we hadn't understood that those problems existed before we pushed out that study to the 100,000 people that it went to initially. So we were able to improve the research and the research materials before they went out to members of the public. Another example would be we did a survey of parents and young people to understand whether they would prick their own finger or a child's finger with one of these small, tiny needles to get a drop of blood to test for antibodies. Because at the moment, you have to be over 18 to do that test. And the survey, we got literally over 4,000 responses. We were just overwhelmed. So that survey wasn't research, it was actually public involvement. So we were just trying to understand what people's viewpoints were before we embarked on any kind of research involving younger children or young people. So parents answered that survey on behalf of their younger children and they gave us insights about the fact that a lot of them said that they would prick their children's finger because they understood it was very important. However, it might be good to have something to distract them with while they were doing that. Others suggested that it would be good to have an alternative like a healthcare centre that they could go to where somebody else might do that for them. The actual young people, so the 16 and 17 year olds, we did an Instagram poll because we thought that would be something that they would be more interested in completing rather than a survey. And so we got them to give us some insights about whether they would personally prick their own fingers And the results of that showed that they would like to do it themselves. They didn't want their parent or guardian doing it for them. So those are the kinds of insights we are able to gather from just talking to people, really. And that's what public involvement is. It's conversations. It's amazing because the members of the public seem to offer such great insights. And it's great that you had so many people respond to the survey. I guess our conversation is making me think back to some of the conversations I've had with researchers about research and public involvement. And some have mentioned that they don't necessarily involve the public to the extent that they should due to various reasons, such as a lack of training or experience or not feeling like they have the right skills or sufficient time. What advice would you give to those researchers? I understand that there are definitely challenges. And I think the advice I would give was there are people that can help, like, for example, My team offers advice and support and training sessions for researchers and members of the public to understand the stages of research and examples of how and when members of the public and patients can help inform their research. And I guess it does depend on the kind of research you're doing. Some research is easier to involve people in and some isn't so easy. So, for example, researchers who are in labs doing testing with test tubes and chemicals and things that obviously isn't something that the public can necessarily help them with but there are other ways that the public can be involved and that research can be kept transparent and there can be accountability about it and that might just be talking to the patient group which the research is about about what you're doing so they're aware of what's going on and they start to feel some ownership towards the project And that will help researchers, for example, when they come to the next stage of research, which might be getting whatever finding they've found implemented to change something. And the patient voice can really be very beneficial to try and lobby or campaign to make something change. I mean, we only have to look back at the 80s with the HIV community to see the amazing work that they did really in patient advocacy about like demanding change because members of the community were dying and they demanded to have access to treatment and better care. So talking to patients is really the first step and then being able to find ways to involve them. It takes a bit of time and planning, but there are patient involvement advisors. There should be in all research centres and they are there to really offer you advice and point you in the right direction of training. But these are things that other researchers face as well. So you're not alone and there are ways definitely of overcoming them. Thanks for giving such great advice. Apart from the training sessions, how else do you practically support researchers to involve the public in their research? 
We offer advice. So for example, each research project will be different. So that means there's no one size fits all kind of public involvement that would be suitable for each project. So you really have to look at them on a case by case basis and understand how the research works to be able to offer advice about how they might best involve the public in that particular project. Often researchers will need advice about how to find the appropriate people to involve because sometimes even if someone's a doctor or a clinician and they see patients every day, they're not always sure whether they can speak to those people about their research. And really, you know, we're there to sort of offer advice about the fact that, yep, they can speak to patients that they see sort of in clinics because they don't need ethics approval to do that because they're asking somebody to help them with their research project rather than to ask them to be a subject in their research project. So we get a lot of questions about how to find the right people to involve or the most appropriate people to involve. So that might be if you're a clinician asking someone that you already treat, but if you're not a clinician, it is quite difficult. So We offer suggestions about third sector organizations like charities or patient groups or nonprofit organizations or community groups that might be able to offer advice to the researcher. And we try and find existing relationships that exist at, for example, the college where we can connect those researchers to those existing relationships because it isn't the case that a researcher needs to talk to a patient group and they can just sort of ask them and instantaneously get a response. You need to build relationships with patient groups or charities to be able to have those kind of relationships. We also have members of the public who act as public partners on various groups around the college who may be able to offer advice because they have the relevant experience in the kind of research that the research is doing or the subject area. So we can partner up people with the relevant experience to researchers, or we can suggest activities through which they can have the conversations and talk to people. So that might be an online focus group, it might be a workshop, it might be a one-on-one conversation, it might be a poll that we do. We've got a platform called voice-global.org and we're using that to try and reach more people to get them involved in research. And so there's a function to have a poll on that. So we try and identify the best medium by which researchers can just start conversations with people, really. It's great to see you can help in so many different ways. Is the support you provide available to researchers outside of Imperial College? So my team, because we're funded by the Imperial Biomedical Research Centre, which is an NIHR five-year funding grant, We primarily provide advice to that funding stream, which is a lot of researchers across Imperial College and Imperial College Healthcare Trust. But because there isn't sort of a central function at the college that provides public involvement advice to other researchers, we try and help as many people as we can. But we do have to limit ourselves to having a connection to Imperial. But online, we've created a resource hub for public involvement, and it's got case studies and template documents and best practice advice. And that's open to anybody. So that's just on our website, on the patient experience research website. And we've had researchers thank us because they've been able to utilize those resources in their own work in different universities around the country. That's really great to hear. So we're coming towards the end of the podcast episode. I have one more question. It's quite a generic question. You're an exceptional public involvement practitioner. What are three top pieces of advice you'll give to researchers about public involvement? I think I would say just get started, do some. It's really just a conversation. And I don't think it's something to be worried or hesitant about because really it's just about talking to people. My second piece of advice would be ask for help. We are here to help you. Even if you're not at Imperial, there will be a public involvement practitioner or advisor that you can go to for help or go to the research design service because they exist all around the country and they have resources to be able to help researchers in all ways, including public involvement. And thirdly, I'd say be open-minded to the value that public involvement can bring to your research. Those are amazing pieces of advice. Is there anything you want to cover which we haven't yet spoken about? 
I don't think so, no. But if you would like some more advice, just please do get in touch. The email is publicinvolvement, all one word, at imperial.ac.uk. Awesome. Thank you, Maria. It was great to have you on this podcast episode. I've learned so much about public involvement and its importance, and I'm sure our listeners have taken a lot away as well. If you are listening to this podcast, please make sure you tune in to our next episode where Maria and I will speak about how members of the public can take part in public involvement and its potential benefits. Thank you.